Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, May 12th, 2020 workshop, uh, Lewiston City Council workshop. Uh, public comment tonight's being handled by question and answers, uh, the question and answer tab, plus the uh, public comment. Uh, can you read? Can you read that for me, Kathy? I don't have it right in front of you. Public comments at lewistonmain.gov. Yes, correct. Okay. So the email address is public comment at lewistonmain.gov. Yes, thank okay. you. All right, good. Thank you. Uh, so is all the staff here? Reference to agenda item number one. I'm not seeing that. Okay, uh, Mr. Mayor, actually, I think the first item is going to be a COVID-19 update from Dennis. Yeah, but is staff ready to go on one as well? They yeah. are, yes. Yes, okay. yes, they are. They're all here. They're in the attendees, and we okay. will activate them to panelists, yes. All right. Oh, I see. That's right. I'm sorry. That's right. They're kind of sitting in the background for us. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. So, Dennis, do you have an update? I do. It's uh, it's brief, but uh, to give the council a, just a quick update on the latest related to COVID-19. Um, on Monday, we did return uh, City Hall staff uh, to their offices. Um, so far, things have been going well. Um, we have a unique situation, I think, or just a good situation from this standpoint for City Hall, where all of our staff have uh, primarily individual offices or at least an, uh, a significant uh, spacing between desks. So we were able to meet all the requirements uh, related to social distancing and get everyone back uh, for the most part. Uh, I would say the large majority of our staff are back in the office uh, at City Hall. Um, working with our recreation staff to get them in uh, to the office at least uh, on uh, by Friday. Um, and we're still continuing to uh, you know, work on the plans around the library and such. Um, and we'll have updates on that. Um, this later this week, uh, we do have uh, meetings organized with some uh, staff within, uh, you know, within city to start discussing or continue discussions, I really should say, related to the economic recovery plan uh, for Lewiston and, and the efforts that we've been, um, that we, we're, we're trying to pull together um, just in response on the other side of this in su support of our businesses and working with them as they try to uh, reopen um, hopefully as the, we continue through the phases. So uh, we're gonna continue to work on that, refine that work, uh, just build on the work that we've really been doing. Our economic development staff have been working with businesses on individual basis, um, fielding their concerns and, and pointing them in the direction of different programs, um, whatever it is in response to their needs. And I think that uh, we're just really taking it to the next level in terms of uh, you know, planning uh, for the next step and the next phases. Um, and that's all I have right now. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions from counselors to Dennis? Questions or comments, Zach? Yeah, uh, is any of that economic development work gonna be presented to the council at some point? Yes, absolutely. Um, what we're doing right now is really just putting some, some framework to the, uh, to the plans and trying to um, do some more brainstorming and try to, I guess, leave no on, no stone unturned uh, in terms of ideas. Uh, but we absolutely plan that's part of the next step is to bring it uh, back to the council um, with uh, with an update on that. Council all set. Ready? All set, Zach. Okay. Uh, For now, Alicia. Yeah. Alicia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I have two questions, and just to clarify, is so City Hall is open for staff. Is it open for the public? Oh, thank you for uh, bringing that up. Uh, it is not open to the public other than still through phone and, and other online business. They can still get their business done that way. Our hope is to finalize a reopening date by appointment only to the public. Um, and we're looking at next week. And I would imagine that we would confirm that and, and start to uh, roll that information out tomorrow. Um, we're just gonna have a uh, staff meeting tomorrow to finalize plans. Uh, make sure that that uh, we are uh, we got a, a firm date for reopening and we'll advertise that uh, again it'll be appointment by only only by appointment to start but then we'll um, we'll go from there and are we requiring masks of our employees and if so are we providing such yes we have provided we have uh, masks cloth masks for our staff um, and essentially it's uh, if they are unable to uh, maintain a social distancing then we've uh, we've asked that they uh, they, they don the masks 
Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions or comments from councilors? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to uh, agenda item number one. Uh, so I see the guests are gonna be Dave Hediger, uh, Mike Gatto, and Mike Connor, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I think uh, Dave could probably present a, a brief introduction to this item and then uh, Mr. Gatto and Mr. Connor could present their uh, request. Okay. Uh, Dave, do we have some video for you? You do. All right. No Take problem. it away, sir. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so um, you'll hear from Mr. Gatto here. He is interested in um, seeing if the council would be willing to repeal an impact fee ordinance that we've had on the books since about 2006. It applies to outer Lisbon Street, it has not been used often at all. He currently has a project right now that would be contributing to the fee and there's some question as to whether or not it really even makes sense to contribute to the fee. Um, I'm not sure if you folks have looked at the memo. <laughs> it may be confusing because the history of this is confusing. I would suggest maybe that um, we hear from Mr. Gatto, he can explain um, what the situation is specific to his project. And then between myself and Ed, we can give you some background as to how the ordinance was actually adopted, what its intent was, and what it's actually accomplished or, or hasn't accomplished in the time that it's been adopted. Okay, good, thank you. So Mr. Gatto, we did get a pretty extensive packet, uh, I believe from you, and then also lots of information from uh, the Director of Planning, Dave Hediger. So just keep that in mind as you present that a lot of the information has already been reviewed by the council. And I'll, if you can take yourself off mute, I'll let you take it away. Mr. Gatto? Yes, I'm sorry. No, that's okay, thank you. Clicking the wrong button, I'm sorry, we'll get to this. We do it all the time. <laughs> I, I do want to keep this very, very brief and, and respond to questions, I think, more than anything. Uh, I'm also here with Mike uh, Connor, if you have any questions of him. Uh, we, we thought it was odd uh, that there was uh, an impact fee out here. I, I was involved in the initial project. And at this point, 15 years later, uh, the traffic has actually decreased. And uh, we've got a project that has been designed with the three-lane section. Uh, peak hours of 247 trips, but we're actually only adding 37 trips to the corridor because most of the traffic coming to a Duncan is bypassed. And it just seemed unfair that there have been several buildings built since 05 on the corridor that didn't pay impact fees because they didn't trigger 100 trips. Um, it just seemed very unfair and, and a very odd way uh, based on my experience in doing developments to assess, um, you know, an impact fee. Typically, it's like if you generate 10 trips, you pay X number of dollars per trip. Uh, this one's based on you got to design a five lane section and then transition and figure out what that cost is. And then you pay a percentage of that. It's kind of odd. So, again, we just thought it was unfair. And so I presented the letter and um, I wrote, we, on behalf of Mike Connor, we both appreciate you guys looking at this issue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gatto. And Mr. Connor, do you have any comments? No, I mean, I, I agree with, with Mike that it was, I mean, we found out about this a little bit of the ways into it. And, you know, we had already spent a significant amount of money only to find out, oh, well, we may have to spend uh, some more. Um, there's a lot of gray areas in it. Like Mike was saying, there's no, there's no black and white, you know, we're kind of, um, Stuck, to, stuck in a wait and see. So it kind of makes things difficult to, to make decisions. Okay, thank you. Dave, do you want to, do you have anything to wrap it up with? Uh, I guess I'd, the, the quick background out here is any project that triggers a traffic movement permit, which is 100 trips in a peak hour, is gonna require um, a left turn movement. And, and that's the whole reason we went to uh, three lanes out there from the from the four lanes, so you could have a designated turning lane, and 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 make a safe left hand turn. And the debate 15 years ago was whether or not we go to four lane, excuse me, five lanes or three lanes. And 
three lanes was seen as a much less expensive option, much more doable, but that fee was in place to ideally collect funds. So someday we would actually have some money in place to do five lanes out there. Um, as Mike suggested, the way this was drafted and adopted, it, it's, it isn't fair. Um, it only targets projects that trigger a traffic movement permit, projects that trigger, excuse me, generate 100 trips in a peak hour. Ideally, it would, um, it would apply to any new project that generates any amount of new traffic out there. It would be it's certainly more equitable. Um, we're never going to collect the funds that we need in order to make a five lane section out there. The data we had from 2005, the data we have from today that Mike has given us shows that there is a, a um, abundance of capacity out there on Lisbon street to handle traffic today and probably for the foreseeable future. Um, as I've said to Mike, we could only be so lucky that Lewiston has that much economic activity that Lisbon street is uh, gridlock and we need five lanes out there. Um, so we've talked it over between myself, administration, public works. It's not a great ordinance. It doesn't need to be in place. Um, we should, we recommend that the council repeal it. All right, good, thank you. Ed? Yeah, there's of course one complicating factor in this, as you noticed in the second long paragraph on the agenda, and that is uh, related to the history of how this thing came about. This uh, started with, with a development by uh, Nino, uh, corporation out there that was a, a basically a gas station. I think at one point there was a Dunkin, there is a Dunkin Donuts in there as well. And he was required to get a traffic movement permit for that project. Basically, there were two alternatives. They could either uh, widen Lisbon Street to five lanes in the, uh, and, and um, put a center turn lane in, in the immediate area of the proposed development or they could go back to the three lane section. The three lane section was chosen. The developer um, undertook that work all the way from the town line, all the way into almost Pleasant Street. Uh, so that they basically restriped that whole street. The city eventually reimbursed the developer for the work um, on the in-town side of the interstate, but he, he picked up the cost for the entire section outside. There was a whole bunch of discussion between the developer and the city council. And a lot of this is still stuff that David and I are trying to get our hands around. Uh, the developer is of the impression that the city has agreed to reimburse him for his full expenditure. And the rate was gonna be reimbursed was um, by way of additional impact fees that were paid in the future. The one impact fee that has been paid uh, was reimbursed to uh, Nino. There is um, a question of whether there is additional funds owed to him and whether those funds should come from future impact fees or not. The whole situation gets a little strange because if he gets fully reimbursed for his project, he will have spent nothing out of pocket for the improvements there. The second person in would have spent $24,000 and then we have this one that I think would be scheduled for like 11,000 or something like that. Uh, that would not necessarily, because I agree with David, this is a bad ordinance, needs to be done away with. So we're still gonna have to have the issue of what to do about the requested reimbursement. David and I will be having a conference call with the developer of that earlier project on Monday. Um, and at some point we will come back with you to you probably with a lot more detail about all of the activities that went on with that initial project and uh, a recommendation or our thoughts on how you might want to, to pursue per, to, to bring that to a conclusion. I do anticipate that you will be getting a formal request from that developer for reimbursement of what he believes is an additional something in the range of $4,000. Okay, thank you. And I I shared an email that I got with you from that developer who was concerned that he wasn't notified of this meeting in a timely manner and also kind of stating his piece about uh, that final reimbursement and how he feels that that should be done. But that, I think you're right, that's for a future discussion. Right. Yes, and that, I, I really wanted to keep the two issues somewhat separate. Now you might wanna resolve that second issue before you finalize this first issue, but as you know, Appealing an ordinance takes first and second reading and all of that uh, stuff, so it's not going to be in done instantaneously. 
Okay. So hopefully if we meet with him next Monday, we can get some more information back to you shortly thereafter and proceed with the, with the process. Do you know when this will be on for first reading, David? No, I mean, I suppose it could be as soon as next Tuesday, but I don't think we're prepared to do that yet at this point. Um, to, to Ed's point, I think we got to get on the same page as far as the numbers, reach out to, to the developer, see what his position is on it. Um, he may agree or disagree with us, um, but yeah, regardless, we, once we figure that out, um, we will come back to you folks. And I would think the two would ha happen um, hand in glove. I personally think that even if you repeal the ordinance, we're going to still have to deal with this financial matter. And that's, you know, he feels that there's an obligation based upon a council action that was taken 15 years ago. Um, so that's, that's a business decision that he made and he hopes that that is warranted going forward. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to open it up to the uh, council for any questions or comments. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I became aware of the situation, I believe it was back in February. I received a communication from Mr. Connor and what he portrayed to me, I, I thought at the time was somewhat incredulous that something like this existed. So I did uh, delve into the ordinances and found the traffic impact fee ordinance. Couldn't understand then what it was all about or why. And it has gotten murkier ever since. The information we have tonight, I mean, I, I would sponsor uh, a repeal of this ordinance in a heartbeat. I, I think it's detrimental to economic development in this corridor out there. Uh, I, I realize we have the second issue to deal with. And I think what Mr. Hedger just brought up, we can deal with them separately or together, but I think the ordinance itself should be repealed. It doesn't make any sense and it's just uh, anti-business as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from councilors? Councilor Gelinas. Um, I think most of my question was answered, but just so that I'm clear. So we're looking at two different repeals. We're looking at a repeal of this traffic impact fee as it pertains to um, people here, but it, we're also looking at a repeal of the ordinance. Is that correct? Two separate things that need to happen, Mr. Barrett? No, it would just be one thing that would need to happen for this development, which is simply to repeal the ordinance. If you repeal the ordinance, they would not be required to pay the traffic impact fee. The second issue, uh, really relates to a much earlier development that was done years ago where the developer at that time feels he was the city made him certain promises that included a full reimbursement of what he was doing at that time to go to three lanes. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from councillors? Councillor Pettengill. Uh, just to kind of echo Councillor Clement that, uh, you know, repealing this ordinance should be high on the list and making the uh, the previous developer whole. You know, if that was a decision that was made then, why why string it out? Let's take care of this and, and get this stuff off the books that's only hindering us and development in the city. Councillor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that the uh, Director of Code and Planning's recommendation is spot on for, for how to resolve this. So I'm in group with that as well. Okay. Ed? Yeah, just one thing to keep in mind is that the way that um, traffic movement permits work in the state, setting aside this ordinance, is if a developer comes in and wants to do a project and that project requires off-site improvements, that developer is required normally to pay for all of those offsite improvements. So for example, when the Dunkin' Donuts was put in on Sabata Street, that project required a traffic signal. That developer was required to spend $150,000 on improvements at that intersection for his project to go forward. The Dunkin' Donuts on Main Street is looking at a three lane section. That is all being done at the developer's cost. So there is typically, depending on the size and nature and location of the project, there can be some significant costs involved for a developer to, to put a project in. So the situation can be very highly variable because it depends on what the, what the ability of the road is to handle the additional traffic. But it's not unusual for a developer to have to pay at least something toward offsite improvements. Okay, thank you. 
Any other questions or comments from the council? So at this point, we'll expect this on the agenda in like the first week of June. Is that what we're thinking or sooner? I would think that makes sense, don't you, David? Yep, first week in June. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Gatto and Mr. Connor, thank you very much. I, uh, I think in general, the council appears supportive of this. Uh, and I would assume that you'll attend that meeting in June. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number two is an update on the public art. Uh, we'll have Darby Ray, Becky Conrad, and Heidi McCarthy uh, joining us shortly. Well, Ed, will Heidi be presenting with Darby and Becky joining in or? I think that uh, Darby and uh, Becky have a uh, PowerPoint or some form of slideshow they want to show, and I'm sure Heidi will also enter into the discussion. But Okay, thank you. Yes, we do, we do, we do. Um, I don't know where my face is, but I guess you get to see my name. So I want you to know that I'm looking just especially fetching this evening. Since you can't see me, I'll just assure you. Um, so thank you so much for having us here. And um, what we'd like to do is um, go through a few slides and um, then um, invite your, your questions. Um, can we get the slideshow up? Is that on your, that's on your end, right? Kathy, that's what we think. Um, I believe Matt, you are doing it. Uh, Darby said that she received an email confirmation that it was received and acknowledged. So I think Matt has that. Okay. I can share my screen if necessary, if I'm allowed. But let's see. I do not have any documentation for this screen sharing. I'm oh, interesting. Okay. I got an email from Lewiston City, something, City of Lewiston today, um, asking for the permission to get into the slideshow and I did that but let me that's very strange I wonder who sent that to me and what they're doing with my presentation <laughs> um, okay uh, so, so, <laughs> here Darby so um, Dennis or Matt can you give Darby screen share rights if she doesn't have those she you should might... have those already okay thank you. Panelist. I'll set Darby as a panelist so if you just want to give it, it a try yeah so Let's see if I can get this. No, it's coming up, yeah. To work. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, where is my, where is, how do I get this going? What do I do? Okay. I, I swear, oh, it's because it's over here and I couldn't see it. Okay. Oops. No. What is that? Ah, sorry. Um, Y'all are in my way. So where's my, um, how do I get this stuff going? There's a slideshow. It's right next to it on present. Oh, it's because, it, okay, it's over here. There we go. All right. Sorry. It's behind my row of faces. <laughs> okay. So thank you. Sorry for that. So what we're going to do is um, just remind um, the council and staff um, what's been going on to date around the public art initiative and then um, share some really exciting news with you. Uh, in hopes that um, when you meet next, you might um, support uh, and vote in favor of the recommendation that we'll be making um, to you tonight. So just as a little background um, and realizing that uh, this all came up in front of a previous council. So to, to back up a little bit, but knowing that you've probably read about this, um, the Chamber and LA Arts together with support from, in writing from both cities, applied for and received a $75,000 grant from the Maine Arts Commission to implement part of Cultural Plan LA, which is a wide ranging plan um, to use arts and culture to keep um, our community moving forward. Um, our specific proposal for the grant was to use public art um, to boost community formation and economic development. So that's one piece of Cultural Plan LA, and that was the piece we chose to 
proposed to work on with the funding from <clears throat> the Arts Commission, um, and specifically to commission one major work of public art for each city to be installed in 2020 or 2021. Um, this grant um, and this project does not require a cash contribution from the city. Um, it does include in-kind contribution for the city, from the city for site work and maintenance. So that's the, the big picture is public art to spur economic development and one piece of public art that we get to um, sort of show um, and, um, and sort of highlight um, to show what the potential of art is to um, continue the forward momentum in our community. So another piece of that was um, the public art plan that um, as part of our overall um, plan that we proposed for the Arts Commission, we said that we would work to get a public art plan um, passed in each of our cities. A public art plan simply provides guidance for the city um, so that um, it knows how to handle public art, how to seek it out, how to raise money for it, um, who to go to for advice. So um, a major part of the public art plan is the establishment of a public art committee that provides expert advice to you all, to city staff and to the city elected officials. Um, the public art committee during the life of the grant is the public art working group that Becky and I chair. And once the grant is finished, probably the one of the last things that we'll do is to consult with each city about the public art committee going forward as the public art working group steps back having finished its work, we hope very successfully. So those are the broad outlines. There's a grant to support public art. There's a public art plan that creates framework for, for now and the future. It, it, the public art plan, you know, is useful, not just in this moment, but going forward, um, we hope. And um, let's see, next slide is the current project. So the current public art project, the one being funded by the grant, began with a request for proposals to Maine-based artists. We were thrilled to receive 11 strong proposals. And I just want to pause here and say that um, this was actually the, the quality of the proposals that we received um, is very exciting because it shows that Lewiston Auburn is being taken seriously by the arts community in Maine. Um, so we got proposals from people who have work all over the country um, and who are considered, you know, Maine's best artists. So we're really excited that they decided to, um, that they would want to have their work in our community because that is their choice. <laughs> um, we then, after we received those proposals, vetted them. Um, we added two high school students, one from each city to our working group um, for that review and selection process. Um, we selected two finalists per city, so two artists and their proposed artworks for Lewiston and two different artists and proposed artworks for Auburn. Um, we then hosted finalist presentations. We invited um, public works staff and um, other city staff. We had both mayors. We had um, uh, Councillor LaJoy was there. Um, we had other other you know, city staff at the finalist um, stage. And then the group um, took all of our own thoughts as well as our guests for those presentations and um, decided on a, a piece of artwork and an artist to recommend to the city for approval. And so that's why we're here tonight is to kind of unveil our recommendation to you and to respond to your questions and your curiosities. And then we hope um, set this recommendation up for approval by you, um, we hope in the near future. So I wanna pause for a quick minute and see if there are questions about anything that I've said before Becky takes over the super fun part of showing you what we would like to bring to our fair city, Lewiston. Any questions about what I've said? Hearing none, I will advance the slide and turn it over to Becky. 
Thanks, Darby, and thank you um, for having us at this workshop tonight. We are very excited we've reached this moment in the process. And again, I'd like to do a, an extra thanks to Heidi McCarthy, who's been a great member of the working committee, did a lot of research around um, policies and economic development impact of public art across the country and really helped us um, formulate our policy. And I want to make sure that we do pause on that just for a moment, that this particular grant is awarded to communities in Maine around economic development. It's how arts and culture drive um, community development and stimulate the economy. So there are many ways to bring public art to communities, and we are bringing this through that lens. This is meant to be a, a statement around um, how we boost our image and it has a multiplier effect and specifically through the potential for tourism as well as um, everything the community will enjoy with the with the two pieces we're unveiling. We have selected to recommend to you and, and thanks again to the mayor and Councilor LaJoy for being part of that conversation and the folks from Public Works who were able to really think through um, if these, if the piece we're recommending will fit, will work, will sustain, and will meet all of the long-term obligations, and they have endorsed this piece. Andy Rosen, some of you may know, he grew up in Auburn, graduated from Edward Little. He has become quite a well-known public artist. Um, his works have been exhibited across the country, and one of the reasons we are suggesting his work is that we would be one of his initial permanent installations, and he's hot and I think he's going to attract um, a lot of attention to our community as a result of his work being installed here. Darby, could you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Some of you may have seen this installation of Andy's when it was down on in Casco Bay. This is a pack of wild dogs um, installed by the Gateway uh, Marine Terminal, and it was part of a temporary installation, and he had a second temporary installation with two deer in the same location. And Bill Needleman, who is the uh, coordinator of the um, Waterfront Economic Development Agency down in Portland, came up and spoke to our community and um, talked about the economic development um, from the number of people who came and photographed this piece. People coming in on the ferry, people from the hotels coming down to see it. So we know that Andy's work has that um, ability to stimulate interest. And Bill also spoke obviously to um, the installation and, the, and how it worked with the city folks. So if you go to the next piece, you will see Andy's proposal for our community. And Darby, can you shrink it in a little bit for me? So the site is between the uh, Baxter Brewing Company and Mill Number no. 5, and it is in the canal, and Andy is representing kind of, these are foxes. They will be- I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't get it to zoom in. Okay, well, no, you're, it's right where it is. It's where okay. you have it, it's exactly the way I wanted it. Oh, perfect. Um, these are a group of foxes. I don't know what you call a group of, what is, it, what is it, a clouder of cats? I don't know what you call a group of foxes. A den? Is it a den of, no, I don't know what it is. Foxes. Um, Andy is working with Moore and Brick Company to fabricate the um, mortar that will be used to make these. They will have a very long life. They will require very little maintenance. And we have talked through the um, way to get into this site and install them. We've talked through what will happen when the buildings are redeveloped. Um, it, it all will work. This, um, this piece, this installation, we believe will be a destination visit for our young kids, our, our, our citizens of Lewiston and our region, as well as people from around the country. Andy's becoming very well known. So we are really excited to recommend this piece to the City Council for approval for the first um, installation as part of this process. And we promise we will make hay with your decision to install this piece and bring you lots of attention. And there's one other slide after this that shows kind of if we wanted to expand and move down toward fish bones, Andy has also talked about that could be part of the, the, the actual um, final installation plan. So I'll stop there and take questions. Um, we are, we're really excited about this piece and um, I think you will find that um, it will deliver on the economic development side of 
our promise to you with this grant. Okay, thank you very much. So can we just take that screen down when you have a sec, Darby? Yes. There, thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Gelinas. I just want to say thank you, Darby and, and Heidi and, and, and Becky. This is exciting. I'm, I'm so excited to see this. I'm trying to get a visual in my head, though, beyond, I mean, it's great work, but what are the dimensions? Like, how, how big is this thing? They are life size. So each of those positioned fox pieces are right around the, the, a good size fox, a healthy fox. <laughs> thank you. Okay, Councillor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm wondering, <clears throat> I'm wondering what what the other proposals consist of. I would I would like to just see if that's possible. Um, and also, what what does the time length look like? Um, just thinking about that. Sure. We don't have access, I don't have access to those other proposals tonight. Um, I, we will say that the other piece, this, that we, so we narrowed it down to two recommendations to each city. And the other piece is a more traditional um, piece of kind of freestanding sculpture that would, uh, actually the artist already has two pieces in this community. Um, and it was made out of um, metal and was part of it was painted so it was a it had some color and it was some moving metal parts and then i'm sorry your second question counselor was um just the time yeah we uh know that the canal would need to be low in order for andy to be in there working and so we assume that would be july of 2021 mm -hmm. and my last question is um does auburn have the same design or this different art installation? It would be a different piece. Different artist, different piece. There, theirs is a, a more of a freestanding sculpture. And they, are, they saw their, uh, we had this conversation with the Auburn City Council last night and they'll be taking it, we think, to their um, city council for a vote next week, as we hope Lewiston will. Um, they're citing their piece in Anniversary Park, which is in New Auburn going um, down behind, you know, I don't know if you know where it is, down behind uh, Raleigh. Raleigh's. Yeah. Thank you. And I, I just want to uh, clarify one thing for the council, although uh, Council Joy and I were invited to the presentations of the two finalists, uh, the decision making was, was done through the, the art commission or committee, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Council, Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Becky and Darby, for this. Um, I I didn't have the artist information in the packet, and as soon as you said Andy Rosen, I perked up um, because I, I admire his work. If I could afford it, I would have some. Um, and so, what a joy it will be to have um, such a fun piece. My one question is. Um, signage that accompanies this piece, um, I think may be important uh, because they are such lifelike creations um, and wouldn't want to concern any residents. Where would the signage be placed for this piece of art? So that part of the process is still, you know, in the works that it will depend on a final sighting and a final piece for each city because they'll have different, you know, needs to do that. But we do envision signage with an artist statement with um, a brief explanation of the piece and we assume we will be doing a little bit of fundraising. The, the grant pays fully for the piece of art, the installation with the support of the city's um, a little bit of site work. The, um, you know, we, there may be a, 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 a local organization or, or company that would like to be helpful with the longer term process. And so some signage might include them as well, but we definitely want signage. I mean, I, we've actually already, we have public art as we know in our community. And so ultimately it would be wonderful to have a way for people to come through and take the tour and stop at each spot. And mm -hmm. really, um, I mean, I think folks can sense my excitement over this piece. I echo um, Councillor Ray's thoughts. Um, I, I, I see 
and I said this to the committee, I mean, I live in Auburn, I came here many years ago to go to Bates. I see Lewiston's cultural future as really strong. You have a downtown development process happening that just, just is open to opportunity and is walkable and people are enjoying living downtown. And this is the kind of piece to me that will say to young people who wanna to come to Maine to settle in communities that are doing these kinds of installations. So I know it's a bit of a stretch and I know that it's not, the, it's not maybe what we were all envisioning as a piece that we would recommend, but for all those reasons that I just said is why we've brought this piece forward. Um, we, and especially that he's a, you know, he's a local person and he, well, you know, the brick, there's a lot of thought that's gone into this and we can tell that story. I, I just feel lucky that this is the piece that was chosen for us. Um, it's also not what I would have expected, but I'm very pleased with that. Um, and I think um, it's just going to add such dimension to that part of town. Um, and then just for reference, a group of foxes, I believe, is called a skulk. Skulk? That's it, a skulk. So. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one, uh, one additional note that I'd like to make, and you can now see me, how fetching I look this evening. Um, so is that, um, you know, I think we would have been excited to receive a, a proposal like this for temporary work from Andy, which is what he's, he's you know, what he did in, in Portland. And um, so, you know, the, when it came, came in, I think we all thought it was temporary. And then we realized, oh my gosh, this would be permanent. And so to get that kind of work from this artist that would be permanent at this price point is really quite amazing. And I think it's because he really wants to contribute to his home state and his home community. And it's really exciting. Heidi, I, I, oh yeah, there, I'm sure there are other questions, but I also want to make sure that Heidi gets a chance at some point to contribute yeah. anything from your perspective, yeah. having been a part of the process all the way, and then also as a city staff member. Okay, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, thank you both for the presentation. Um, really cool to see, I should say the three of you. Um, my question is, why was that particular location selected, and were there any other locations that you were looking at? Well, the the work in the water is part of Andy's, one of the things he, he, he focuses on. Um, he, he, he talks about um, kind of the history of the community, the canals, where the canal water comes from, how nature has moved into the urban area, how we interact with nature, um, how it would startle people maybe that's you know public art is meant to make us take pause and think um so he liked the waterfall he liked the uh, you know the notion that there's a lot of economic um movement down there that there there's I mean, more and more and more people um so he wanted to be along the canal somewhere and he did ask if that would be possible and we checked and was, we were told it was possible so that's where he's suggesting but as the diagram showed He's, you know, it could move along the canal system, but he does see this as part of the artwork that it would be in the canal system. Yeah, I think one of the things he suggested is that he, that the main installation, as we saw in the visual, would be where he's proposing and that he might do like a teaser, like a single fox somewhere else that could, you know, draw attention, draw people into the main exhibition. But the grant, I'll just say, um, I mean, the cultural plan and what we proposed for the grant was um, to put art at um, either at a gateway location or a key corridor. And so economically, the sort of, you know, work around the mills in the downtown and that particular walk right there, Tom Platts is doing some work with public art in that walk. So it'll, it'll become an arts-based key corridor. Um, and so this installation kind of contributes to some real momentum around public art that is um, already with the um, Lewiston Rattles piece there um, already has has already begun, but that it's going to be um, gathering more and more momentum. So that was another reason for that location because it can connect to um, some other work. So that eventually, you know, we hope there will be a sculpture walk that people come up from Boston to experience. Right? 
not not just from Portland. Like we, like Portland, we're so looking beyond Portland. Like everybody from Portland is going to come see this because it's Andy Rosen's most recent work. Everybody, we we've got our sights set bigger than that. Okay. Well, thank you. Okay, Council of Pattonville. Thanks, everybody, um, especially for doing the, the work to get some art up here, more art. Um, I do have to ask, is there going to be lighting associated with that? Um, because as it is, uh, main winter comes in quick, and that corridor is particularly dark um, at night. So I, I worry, especially in the winter months, as we head, head into winter, that we're going to lose the art because nobody will be able to see it. I think that's a great question, and it's something that um, we hope to raise money to be able to do. Yep, we, and, we, we totally agree with you. And Tom Platts talked about his obligation on the side of the building that he's in control of currently and potentially long term being part of the whole plan. Especially for art, we couldn't ask for a, a better partner in, in bringing more to the city. So I, I think especially in that location where we're lucky to have Mr. Platts as uh, an ally and somebody to help. Yeah, and you know, right now that um, the kind of ugly old tattered bridge thing that's above that canal, right? Connecting the Fishbones to the Mill 5, um, the Fishbones Mill, which mill is that? Is that three, four, five, six? I don't know, anyway, okay. So that is eventually gonna be a glass walkway across the way. So you'll be able to look down at the foxes from you know this glass walkover, I mean, it just gives me chills to think about it. And and Andy said, you know, he could, with that in mind, you know, make sure there's a fox looking up, right? So that when you look down, you're staring in the eyes of a fox. Really cool. Ah, <laughs> uh, so the fish bones mill is is mill one, I think, which is actually Thank you. next to there. That's the Baxter Brew and that. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yep. but all. I think uh, a good entertainment area in general and the potential there is great. So Heidi has a staff member. Can you just share uh, how you, were you you're, you're part of this committee, correct? Yes, uh, I was appointed to this committee um, uh, as uh, a city representative uh, and it's been a wonderful experience uh, and it's really, uh, it's been great to be a part of this committee, partially because they are so motivated to, to get things done. Like the, the amount of work that this committee done in such a short amount of time is really amazing. Uh, and I'm excited that I think this piece is going to um, bring people here and I'm, I'm really excited to be a part of that. All right, thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments from the council? Okay, if not, we look forward to seeing this on a future agenda item. Thank you very much, Darby, Heidi, and Rebecca. Much appreciated all the hard work. Thank you. Thanks. Right back Thank at y'all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to uh, agenda item number three. Uh, Dale Doughty and David Gracelon will be invited to the meeting. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, so Dale, you'll be presented. I just want to make sure that uh, Mr. Garcelon is connected with us. Mr. Garcelon, can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm on the phone, so I don't know. Can you hear me? We can very clearly. So thank you very much for attending and being present with us. Dale is going to present for the most part. We did get uh, a packet of information uh, from you and uh, much appreciated. You provided a lot of information for us. Uh, I recall back when I was on the city council uh, that you presented in front of our council back then. So uh, we appreciate all the good work you've done with that, uh, that cemetery. And Dale, if you could just take it away for us. Sure. 
Um, you kind of stole my first line. The first line oh, is this has come in front of council, a couple of councils, um, and apparently the one that you were on, Mr. Mayor, um, in different in different ways and different elements. And the most recent one um, was last um, April. Um, David and his association wrote a letter to the city um, requesting assistance um, with the management um, and um, and uh, maintenance of Gaslawn Cemetery and. Over time, the association uh, members have gotten older and, um, and there are less and his, um, the, their financial capability has, has diminished somewhat. So he asked us for help. Um, uh, Mr. Gosselin, myself, and a couple of my staff members went out and met with him at the end of the season last year. I think it was sometime early November and, um, and kind of came up with a plan um, based on the last council's guidance to us and that was, develop an MOA for a kind of um, transitional transition from um, the Gosselin Cemetery Association to public works and work in partnership in between. So that's, that's part of what you have in front of you. You have an agreement. Um, the Gosselin Cemetery um, Association, or the Gosselin Cemetery was um, established in, on May 17th, um, 1819. Um, that's an important date that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, the association began maintenance um, in 1905. So they've been maintaining it faithfully for all these years. Um, the city from time to time has assisted them when we can, especially our arborist and his specialty and the crew and the bucket truck. So they've, we, we've helped out, but it's, a, it's very much been theirs to maintain. The cemetery consists of three lots. One lot is the, the middle size lot in the back um, is clearly under city ownership, and that's important. And we'll talk about why in a few moments. Um, there are two other lots. One, and those are, um, we don't always disagree, uh, we don't always agree with, um, with one another about the ownership, and it's somewhat cloudy. These date back to the very um, early years of Lewiston and a transition between two counties. So it, it is murky. Um, and, and so the, Clearly one of the three lots belongs to the city. Another one may um, have some um, ownership in the city or partnership, but it may also be owned by the association. And a third one is owned by the heirs of, uh, of um, John B. Gosselon, or it appears to be. But those are, those are important factors in a few moments, but, uh, and you'll see why. Um, the, among these um, 470 souls um, buried in the cemetery, um, 32 are veterans and either veterans or of the revolution, veterans of some foreign wars and just veterans during peacetime. That's important and that's spread all throughout the cemetery. And you, in the packet you have, you can see um, those um, graves uh, marked and you can see that they're spread out. That's also going to be an important factor in a few moments. Um, there are lots that most of the lots are committed and there are people there, but there are some that are committed by the association um, that are that are, are future plots um, and there are some that are uncommitted and that's going to be um, important in a couple moments. We, we talked to the city attorneys um, last year and Brandon Einstein wrote a letter um, indicating that state law is muddy around this um, this topic. There are two statutes. Um, that are somewhat important. One statue um, gives the city authority, but not the requirement to maintain cemeteries under certain conditions. Um, one of those is the cemeteries that are established before 1880. Those are classified as ancient burial, burial grounds. And the city has the authority, or if there's a veteran's grave, and the city has authority to maintain certain things if they're not being maintained, but not the requirement. The next statute, um, is a bit contradictory and it um, requires the city under certain circumstances. So in cases where veterans graves and headstones, monuments, markers are located on a private burial ground, if the burial ground was, was established prior to 1880, the city has certain requirements around those burial, those burial sites and the accoutrements around certain parts of the cemetery. So there's, the city certainly has the authority um, to maintain this, this cemetery, all three plots. Um, it has the requirement to maintain components of the cemetery, 
if the association no longer can do it or in partnership with the association. Um, so that, like I said, those two statutes are, are not completely clear and they wrote back three or four pages about how that applies to this one. And um, I think that's, that's pretty much a summary of the, of the conclusions and, and may remember others. Um, we talked a little bit about um, the association kind of, um, um, you know, really their membership dwindling over time and their financial ability. And they have a couple thousand dollars left, I believe. I think it was 1700 or something last year when we met or somewhere in that vicinity. What we kind of came up with when um, Dave and his staff, Dave and my staff met were maybe a transition over time that we might start to take over the routine maintenance of the cemetery, mowing, leaf um, collection, and those sorts of things. And that they might continue to do with the funds through some of the large one-time capital. There are a number of gravestones out there that have been damaged due to weather and other um, tree falls and other items they've fallen over. And our hope was that they could either in person or through um, a contractor do some of that, heavy, that, that one time work. The wrought iron fence that surrounds the cemetery is collapsing in places. And David talked about the possibility of removing that fence um, where it's not really necessary. It's becoming an eyesore and at some point it has to be. Our thought was that we would start that process this spring um, and that the association could continue to expend their funds until their funds are exhausted. Once their funds are exhausted, we thought that the cemetery association, Castellan Cemetery Association, could work with us as an advisor on how we maintain. Um, so stay involved as long as they desire to, but more as an advisor to the city and how we would continue to maintain it. Um, we, we, um, sent part of the agreement and Kathy told me that this is consistent with what we've done with others, that if there are plots that are sold and committed, that we would honor those, but the city would cease, once the city started routine maintenance, once the ex agreement was executed, we'd cease selling any future lots and it would just become um, a, a, um, a, 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 a cemetery that's just being maintained as it exists today. And I think Kathy and I spoke, and I think that's, that's similar to what we've done in other places and consistent. The costs, um, a lot of the work that's been done in the past um, is uh, done, or the larger work has been done, spring cleanup, fall cleanup, some of the other repairs. Um, the Garcelon Cemetery Association have gone out and physically done that themselves and sometimes had a contractor. They did have a contractor doing the routine maintenance and things, and they spend about $2,000 a year. We had our staff look at what the cost would be to the city if we were to maintain it soup to nuts once this all transitioned in a year or two. Um, and we believe that would cost us annually for everything um, about anywhere between three and $4,000. And if we use the, their contract, we may be able to do that a little bit cheaper, but that's, uh, that's kind of the, the ballpark that we, we think we're in. So I think that's pretty much up in a nutshell. Um, like you said, you had a lot in your packet. We have that letter from Brandon Isaacson. If any of the councils would like to see that, I certainly can share that with them. Mark, Mark, you're on mute. Thank you. I was gonna blame uh, my computer. Can you just go over again, you spoke briefly about the lots, uh, the empty lots. Would we be trying to sell those or not? No, we would, we would honor the ones that have been sold. So as people passed away, however many of those are, and I haven't got a list from Dave yet, but we would honor those. And then there would be no future, uh, there would no longer be an active burial site once all of those people have passed on and, and are there. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Garcelon, is there anything you'd like to add to the presentation that uh, was just presented? No, I think Dale covered it very well. Okay, thank you. I'm happy with what he said, and I'm in agreement with it. Very good. Thank you, sir. The, uh, only, the only thing that I'm wondering, uh, we, we do have a uh, carrier lawn and landscaping has been doing the work for us. Uh, it's been up and down depending on who they have doing the work. I think it's, I think it's an employee problem for Carrier. Uh, the last man they put on it has been doing an excellent job. 
Okay, I I see that uh, I was muted and now I'm unmuted. Okay, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Goss, Carrier Carrier's doing a good job. They're charging us $160 per mowing, uh, plus $300 for spring cleanup and $300 for fall cleanup, and they do about uh, 10 mowings. So that comes to, I think this year they did 10 mowing. So that would be $2,200 we spent this year. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first, I just want to thank you, Mr. Garcelon, and the association for all the work you do. Um, it's an important part of our history. Uh, next, uh, I just want to mention too that I've, I like to visit cemeteries in the city and check them out. Um, it's, you know, it's a cool part of our history and, and um, it's part of our culture and heritage too. Um, and I know the iron fencing has always been bugging me. I actually have pictures on my phone from like back in 2016, just how much it stood out and how much it needs to be addressed. Um, so I'm really happy to see that, that that's going to be happening. I am fully in support of the city taking over responsibilities for the cemetery. And I agree that um, probably shouldn't have any further sales of, of plots, but we should um, respect the ones that have been purchased already. Um, just in regards to cemeteries in general, I mean, it's tough because they're not quite used the way they used to. People used to go like have picnics there, but in modern times and the era of zombie movies, we really don't think of them that way anymore. Um, so I really see the cemeteries as like right now, we just don't do too much with them. They're, they're almost just come, come with a cost. So overall, I'd like to see the city down the road um, develop some kind of, not necessarily plan for the cemeteries, but um, maybe take over more maintenance, make more opportunities available um, for the schools, um, history classes. There's a lot you can learn from there, and there's a lot of lessons that can be made around cemeteries. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of potential for them. So maybe we as a city down in the years ahead, we can consider what, what we can and can't do with them. Um, but I, I'm really happy to see this going forward. Um, it was cool to see the history of the cemetery as well. Um, so thanks to everybody involved. And again, I am fully in support. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The city, the we've given we've given tours of the cemetery and given a tour of the cemetery is like telling the early history of the city and uh very much so. It it was one of the first cemetery actually it replaced the first cemetery in Lewiston. Uh the first cemetery in Lewiston was washed out by the Androscoggin River flood. And uh, the bodies that didn't get washed down the river were moved up to this cemetery. Uh, so um, all of you there are going to die sometime, and you'll be buried in the cemetery. And if you become famous in the meantime, you'll make you'll be part of the history of the city of Lewis and uh, and with a fence around you in a cemetery. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm sure uh, Councillors Pettengill and Councillor LaJoy will remember hearing this um, great historian speak to us last June as well um, about Garcelon Cemetery. And so um, good refresher, good to see we're following up on this. My question is for Dale. Um, are there potentially other cemeteries under other organizations care that could approach us with a similar agreement um, not to say that they would, but um, kind of we're, let it, we're laying out a precedent here. There are, and I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but I remember having a conversation with Councilor Marcotte soon after that June meeting. Um, and he, um, being a somewhat of a historian <laughs> himself, rattled off a series of them that, that, that he thought might um, have that interest someday. Um, certainly some of them, according to him, and I, I believe it's probably true that they do it because they want it done a certain way, but at some point there's, there's, there's a, there is a possibility, yes. Ed, did you want to answer that too? Yeah, I just was going to go, going to mention, and Kathy can add to this, that this is not the precedent. The precedent's already been set. The city already has, has taken over the maintenance of a number of cemeteries that were abandoned. And in spite of that rather lengthy legal opinion, I think when it boils right down to it, if the cemetery is older than a certain age and if it has uh, any veterans buried in it, you might as well just assume that you have to maintain it. And that compounded here by the fact that the city actually owns roughly a third of it in terms of land area, a little bit more than a third. So I don't think this is going to create a precedent and 
because I scared the mayor the other day. I said, well, you know, any, uh, virtually any cemetery in town, if, they, if, the, if the people who are taking care of it now disappear, that's going to end up being the cities. And he quickly noticed that there are a number of very large cemeteries in town that mm -hmm. would certainly put a strain on our budget. Yeah, if we ever, when the time comes, which eventually I think it will happen, uh, we'd have to have an entire department just to maintain cemeteries. Uh, that's a big job, and it's happening to a lot of communities uh, throughout the state. Anything else, Councilor Ray? Yeah, it's just an incident, interesting precedent, and I believe the the sort of inaction last June was uh, we workshopped this as well, and um, I think there there was just some clarification needed, which has been that color has been added tonight thanks to Dale. Um, it still makes me quite nervous um, to take on these responsibilities, but if we're doing it piecemeal over time, that seems a more savory solution than all at once. Okay, thank you. I might, I might, I might add uh, a little interesting historical note. The Gaslon family owned all that land along Ferry Road, hundreds of acres along Ferry Road, and that was given uh, by it was initially given by a Gaslon. Many years later, Alonzo Gaslon and several other movers and shakers in Lewiston formed the Riverside Cemetery. And Alonzo is buried. He, when you drive in by the house, his his stone is right there, dead center of the, where the driveway splits. That's Alonzo Gaslon's grave. Of course, he was a select man and a senator and a governor. But uh, so the Gaslons. Uh, have buried a lot of people in cemeteries in Lewiston. <laughs> All right, thank you. Councilor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. I, um, my question was asked by Alicia and it answered, but um, I'm just thinking out loud. Um, that one spot that a parent in the city owns, why can't they just, why can't we just take care of that instead of I mean, I definitely understand that the association does not have money, um, and I don't know how cemeteries work at all. But um, yeah, and I, I, I try to read it again and again to understand how it came under the ownership of the city, um, and I somehow understand it. But I'm just thinking that one spot or one that one portion that apparently the city owns. I don't know. I just feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I don't know. If I, if I could, so by law, if uh, there's a veteran in the cemetery or it's an ancient burial ground, uh, the city has the ultimate responsibility if no association can maintain it anymore, the city has to provide that service. And Ed or Dale, feel free to correct me if that's misspoken. I think that's true. And I think uh, this, this agreement, this transition provides a couple things. One, it provides us, you know, if, if the association got up and left, we would certainly have um, obligations to components in each of those plots, or at least two out of the three, the two larger ones, and maybe even the third one, and the fence, and mowing around the graves, which would be, would be spotty. So it offers um, a, some clarity there if they just decided to go. The other thing is the association has collected dues that they've got to find some way to eventually dissolve themselves. This offers them that opportunity and removes some of that responsibility from the city. So I think it kind of meets both organizations needs somewhere in the middle. Just just my my take on it. We we have we have in a trust fund um when I inherited, when I became president quite a few years ago now, but we, I have built the trust fund up to over $12,000. Of course, it's invested in a bond, so that value can go up and down. But right now we've got $12,000 and it, it, I can tell you that it is, it is the desire of all the people in the association, whether they uh, die between now and when we expend all the money to spend that on the cemetery. And so the only the only thing we need on the bond is to have the current members of the association make a vote that we can take it out of the bond and spend it. Uh, so, but no one in the association wants to spend that money on anything but the cemetery. Okay, thank you. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this cemetery is located in my ward. I first became aware of it. We moved into Lewiston and I 
have since, uh, through this process, found out a lot of interesting things about it. I believe, uh, Dale, correct me, the state requires us to place flags on all veterans' graves. Is that correct? That's a, an unfunded mandate, typical of yeah. the state of Maine. They, they pass these uh, edicts out and require the municipality to fund them. Um, we have volunteer groups, but Kathy and I are working because of COVID to maybe have public works take a little different role this year because of the COVID, but yes. Yeah, but we have to provide the flags and fund that part. Is that correct? Yep. And I, I think it makes perfect sense if we're going to, I, I think we owe it to our veterans. Um, you know, that they're at a point where we can only do so much for them now. And I, I think that's a small token. Uh, and if you're going to do 32 or whatever it is, graves out of uh, 400 and some odd that are there, uh, that's gonna look like a bad haircut, you know, patches here and patches there. But I, 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 I see this as a plan that's workable and I would support this. Thank you very much. Councilor Pattengill. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Mr. Garcelon and his family for uh, their service to our community. Um, and I'd, I'd be worried about the precedent we'd set by not taking care of, you know, those that are buried on these grounds, and especially where it's such a, such a deep part of, of Lewison's history. Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I forgot to mention before, um, the headstones that we have, not just at Garcelon uh, Cemetery, but in all the cemeteries in town, there's some very beautiful headstones, and there's some great uh, headstone artists that were in the Lewiston community. Um, that's that's uh, not, not always known, and so um, we talk about our previous agenda item. I think it's important to note, too, that there's some beautiful headstones in Lewiston Cemetery. Um, they should certainly be something that we um, kind of show off as a city. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the council? And when can the council expect this to come before us again? Next week. Yeah. Next Mr. Tuesday. Mr. has seen it. He's edited his comments. I think we're ready to, as that said, bring it right back. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gosselon, thank you very much for attending this meeting tonight. And we're going to put this on our next agenda. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to agenda item number four, and the rock star city clerk, <laughs> Kathy Montego, will present. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so as you have in your council packet handout, uh, you know that we initially had the state primary election scheduled for June 9th, and the municipal school budget referendum on uh, today actually was the original date. Uh, so both have been postponed as a result of the public health pandemic and have been moved to uh, Tuesday, July 14th. So planning a, uh, an election during a public health pandemic obviously is very challenging. And one of the items that we are discovering is, or we have concerns about, is the inability to adequately staff the polling places if all seven polling places are open. Uh, on that election day. Many of our workers, of course, are fall into the at-risk category age-wise because a lot of retired people tend to be available to work at the polls. Uh, actually, as of today, two out of our seven supervisors called and said they are not interested or able to work uh, on July 14th because of their own concerns regarding their own health and safety which we respect and understand. So in the middle of March, when all of this started out, uh, the Lewiston did submit a general request and informal inquiry to the Secretary of State's office asking if communities would have the ability to consolidate if the municipal officials are interested in doing that. We're still waiting for an answer on that. Uh, it might be kind of a low priority for the state to look at because it only pertains to about 12 communities in the whole state. Believe it or not, there are only, according to the Secretary of State's office, 12 communities that have multiple polling places around the state, and the rest all have one polling place. So consolidating only impacts a couple of communities. Uh, but our number one concern for the reason to consolidate is because we're just not sure that we can adequately staff. As you know, we would normally have seven polling places with about 150 citizens working, and we're just not sure that we can hire uh, that many people uh, to work uh, on July 14th. Other concerns are logistical. Uh, we need to space out due to social distancing. We need to put the voting booth six feet apart, the check-in table six feet apart, the voters in line six feet apart. So that is going to take a lot of logistical maneuvering and we're gonna obviously try to think that through 
as much as possible in advance, but a lot of it might be just adjusted on the fly when we see how it works on election day. So having one central spot to control seems to be easier. Um, another one is the procurement of supplies. The state is trying to get some supplies for us regarding the PPE for the workers as well as cleaning supplies. Uh, it has been recommended that we wipe down every voting booth uh, after a voter has used it. It's also been recommended that we wipe down every pen after a voter has used it. So we're still waiting for final information from the Secretary of State's office and the CDC regarding those regulations. Uh, but we're going to require a lot of supplies and equipment, again, provided between the state and the city. Um, but another really major reason is there are a lot of organizations that are strongly encouraging to consider, strongly encouraging voters to consider voting by absentee ballot for this election and not going to their polling places in person. Um, we, the city actually, we just launched our website today regarding the July 14th election letting people know the information about obtaining an absentee ballot, registering to vote through the mail, and that sort of a thing. So the in-person foot traffic on election day is projected to be low. As far as past turnouts for this type of election, and I should just clarify this, on, on July 14th, there'll actually be three elections happening simultaneously. One is the state primary election for the Democratic Party and the Republican Party for those folks to choose their candidates to face off in November. Historically, for a June primary, we have had turnout between 7% and 18%, depending upon what else might be on the ballot as a referendum, so fairly low turnout. Also on the ballot will be two state referendum questions, a broadband uh, question and a transportation bond. And then, of course, we'll have the school budget election. And historically, the school budget election in the past five years has not hit higher than 5% voter turnout. So we're not expecting large turnouts in general for this election because of what's on the ballot. And then due to the encouragement of absentee voting, we're just not expecting high foot traffic. So because of those factors and a couple others, we wanted to approach the city council to find out their preference and desire for the city to consolidate polls. Of course, the target location would be the Longley School where three out of the seven wards vote anyway, that's their normal polling place. Um, so that was basically our recommendation. The bottom of the memo does outline the steps for you. Uh, before we can proceed too far, the governor does have to issue that allowance for communities, which we've been told is forthcoming. Uh, we're just not sure when, but the Secretary of State's office is pretty confident that the governor will approve that. And then the city will have to conduct a public hearing uh, to receive feedback from that and then to conduct, uh, oh, to approve an order and then we would have to have the Secretary of State's office approve it. What we're waiting for basically from the governor is the law does allow currently for communities to go through the process to consolidate polls. You need to hold a public hearing and have the council approve the order. However, the law does require a 90 day window and we are now within that window. So that's really the waiver that we would like the governor to issue is to allow us to do the full process just in a shorter period of time. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I'll be happy to answer any questions from the council. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Uh, questions or comments? Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I believe I voiced my opinion when this was first brought up, but I just wanted to voice it publicly that I am not in particularly in support of this plan um, as I think about a couple of the issues um, in terms of having poll workers. I do understand that most of our steadfast ones are in the at-risk categories and are choosing to keep themselves safe, which I respect. There are a lot of people who are out of work now. And so I think through recruitment efforts, we could maybe get a new crop of folks um, who are uh, able to help us out, not just in this election, but in the future. Um, I think, you know, the, the best laid plans were for the March 3rd presidential primary and um, things went pretty off track from what we've heard from constituents. Um, and so, I am reticent to um, be super gun ho for this plan um, at this point in time. I also think if we spread it out over more locations, you've got a better shot at social distancing as well. This is all in the same breath that I recognize the armory is no longer available to us for, the, for a polling location, um, and that is for two words. So um, it would be what, Longley, Montello would possibly be open. And is there another polling location? The Green Ladle for Ward 6. Right, which could possibly also be open, but I do believe they've had students in preparing meals for 
um, seniors. So um, I, I realize there are future or there are bigger implications, but um, I'm usually never in, in favor of consolidating polling locations. And so I, I remain in that camp currently. Thank you, Councilor Jensen. Thanks, Mr. Rear. Uh, I largely echo a lot of uh, Councilor Ray's thoughts on that. Um, although, given everything, I, I, I am okay with consolidating the polling location, um, but I understand there may still be some issues down the road, um, so long as there's no events happening at the Colisee. Um, I did want to mention, too, I noticed in the, the packet that we got, uh, you mentioned that absentee ballots can be done at City Hall up until 8 p.m. on Election Day. So in essence, on Election Day, people could technically go into City Hall also to vote. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's a new um, clause that the governor enacted for July 14th. So City Hall will be available, um, or I should say absentee ballots. Typically in a regular election under the law, the cutoff to request an absentee ballot is the Thursday before the Tuesday election. So anyone who wants to vote by absentee ballot on that Friday or Monday, unless they have a special circumstance under the law, such as a disability or they're a shut-in, um, other voters would not be able to obtain an absentee ballot and would have to go to the polls. So the governor waived that. So absentee voting will happen right up until 8 p.m. on election night here at City Hall. Thank you. Essentially creating another polling place, if you will, actually. Anything else, Councilor Jensen? Okay, Councilor Khalid. Councilor Khalid. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I am also very uncomfortable and against consolidating in one polling location. Um, it just raises a lot of flags, especially in the time of we need to, you know, social distance. Um, I have few, I was just there brainstorming with like ways to help you, um, Kathy, and I'm thinking of, I know that one big reason why we're doing this is because we don't have a lot of um, poll workers and maybe what we can do is put out there like we need volunteers, um, young volunteers, young people who, who would like to volunteer. Maybe that's an option. Um, and then maybe I don't know about training and all of that, but that's one thing I was thinking. But the other thing I'm thinking about is for the immigrant community, they don't, especially um, those who don't speak English or English not their first language, they don't usually use ballots. So it's really hard for them to request it, um, especially where even I was just looking at the ballot um, at the state website and even on the city website, it's only, um, the English is the English language is on there. There's no other languages provided on the absentee ballot. Um, so that so those are like some things I was thinking about. Um, and the other thing is, I know the armory is being used, but maybe in the future, even like for presidential, um, we can look at the armory sometime in the future and not lonely make the, with the call say not having lonely as our primary location for um for you know people to vote so what other thing yeah i'm just yeah i just hope we can like think about other options instead of one polling locations even though i know it's hard thank you council of the joy Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I think uh, I know that uh, Kathy brought up uh, many valid reasons uh, to go to one location. It's not like we haven't done it previously. We have. It's worked well. And I think from those previous times, uh, we've learned many lessons as well uh, as to uh, the voter control uh, and and so on. So I think she's brought up many valid reasons. I think under the conditions we're at, uh, I agree with uh, with her suggestion to have uh, one area as a voting area. Uh, and if it's, uh, uh, I call it the multi-purpose center, but uh, uh, if that's the location, then I would agree with that. And I would say, go ahead. Uh, I do have some reservations, but in this case and under 
the uh, reasoning that Kathy gave. I feel very comfortable with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Pettengill. Uh, I, I wanted to echo, uh, you know, what Councillor LaJoy said that I, I think it makes sense in this instance to have a singular voting location. Um, it, it fits with the times and, you know, we need to get the, the word out so we can get voters to it. And I, I worry if by spreading the polling locations out across the city, we may actually see a decrease in, in voter turnout. Uh, not to mention the, the logistics of that for us as a city with not having people to staff the, the voting places as well. So I'd, I'd have to agree that it, it makes sense to have a singular location. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I also agree with Councillors uh, Pettengill and LaJoy. Uh, the last instance of Longley, uh, the perfect storm was created I don't see that happening again, particularly with the current situation we're in. I can't imagine what's going to be occurring at the Colisee. They're going to be shut down. I think it makes sense uh, in the future, uh, perhaps not this time, to look at maybe two locations, the Armory and Longley. Uh, obviously, the Armory is out right now, but uh, I've listened to what uh, the clerk has had to say. I communicated with her after the, the last uh, uh, deal that we had at Longley and you know for all of the complaints that supposedly were echoed I heard none from anyone in my ward uh, I don't see this as a major issue given the constraints that are upon us uh, I don't know what else we can do if we don't have sufficient staff I think we take and open ourselves up to accusations of voter fraud uh, election fraud whatever you want to call it uh, you've got to have proper staff there it doesn't sound like we're going to be able to do that uh, I don't think you can go out and uh, enlist a whole cadre of new people. You've got to have some experience at these. These these positions are important positions. They're not the highest paid positions in the world, however. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't see this being handled by volunteers or a whole bunch of newbies. I think that the, the clerk has come up with a workable plan, and I would support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Gelinas. You know, I, and I think something that you said, um, Kathy, that made me think is, you know, the extension of the absentee voting, uh, it really does create a second voting place. I mean, I, I, I know it's, if you really think about the amount of people that will choose to do that, I think it's going to be significant. Um, and I also feel like we've learned a lot. I, I, I have total trust that this is going to be handled safely and wisely, um, and I would support it. Great, thank you. All right, good. Thank you, counselors. I also uh, support uh, that single uh, voting place this year. I think there were some uh, lessons learned during the last time, but I also think that was very unexpected. Uh, so I think staff did well con considering what they were challenged with that day. Any other questions or comments from the council? Councilor Pettengill? Uh, you, you made a good point there, and I just wanted to say that uh, city staff did a fantastic job with the hand that they were dealt the last time with the, uh, the games and how um, unanticipated all that was at the time. It, it, was, it was a great, great job that they did, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Clement? Just one thing, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have sufficient time now, and I'm sure that we'll be educating uh, the voters of the uh, addition of the time at City Hall and the fact that they can vote in person prior to said election and get it out of the way as we open up City Hall. So I think it presents an opportunity to increase the amount of education via social media or whatever to get the word out there that that is an option. And I, I think together the plan will work uh, very nicely. Thank you. When do, when do you expect the uh, waiver, Kathy, or hearing from that? Uh, I, I don't know. We can follow up with the Secretary of State's office tomorrow to see if they have any idea on that. I don't know. Like I submit, said, we submitted our initial request March 13th, and we still haven't heard back yet, but I know they're being inundated with lots of logistical questions regarding the election. So hopefully soon, but we don't know. Yeah, on Councilor Clement's point, the, the sooner we know, the more education and time that we have to, to put into that effort. So. Right, right. Uh, Councilor Ray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think 
it, I mean, it sounds like a majority are willing to move forward that, with that plan. And so um, as I think about some of the concerns that we have, especially translation services, is there a way to work with the school department? I know they have a really robust um, or it, perhaps a more robust uh, program for translation services than our city hall might have at this point. Um, and then when might we expect translations of the ballots to be on the SOS website? Um, the ballots are usually 30 days prior to the election. So I don't know that you're gonna have the samples uh, much before that. So I would say mid June, the sample ballots will be on the website. And we'll certainly reach out to the school about any services that we might be able to partner with. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. And sorry, one last question. I think I remember from one of the past discussions about elections that the state only translates into French. Is that correct? Or do they do more languages? Uh, they actually don't translate any ballots. Oh. They translate the instructions into French, but uh, all of the ballots are printed in English and none of them have been translated. Uh, that's not to say, though, that we couldn't take Sophia's recommendation and have them translated on our own and put that equivalent on the city website. We'll get uh, confirmation from the Secretary of State's office, but I don't believe that's prohibited for us to do. Okay, and sorry, this is, I just requested my absentee ballot, which I'm very excited about. Never voted absentee before, so I don't know that process. When it's mailed, is it automatically mailed with just the English instructions, or can folks uh, request what language instruction? It is automatically mailed with the English instructions. So we can look at having the instructions translated and uh, having that available again on the city website and by request as well. I think a lot of the ballot, if you look at it, is somewhat intuitive as far as the ovals next to the name um, and filling that in. But certainly I know if someone was to read vote for one, you, you may not know what that says. So I certainly understand the concerns that Councillor Khalid is bringing up. So we'll take a look at that. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. All right, if nothing else, thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you. All right, agenda uh, item number five, and Dale will be presenting on this, social distance in pavement markings. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. I think I can make this relatively quick. Um, Deputy Dote and I received a request from one business so far that their, um, their lobby and their anticipated um, patrons won't be able to socially distance without, um, at times, without having to go outside. Um, they're looking at opening in mid-June. Um, and we were chatting and we thought that um, this is likely to become more and more prevalent as the governor opens up the state. So we thought we'd come up with some criteria that would um, parallel the state law that would um, be easy and simple and something that public works could go support that business and get those installed quickly for them um, and that wouldn't run into conflicts with other um, pavement markings like utility markings and other things that might cause a safety or, or um, traffic issue. So. What we came up with that you have in front of you is just a brief memo um, that talks about, and with your permission, if, if that's something we can go execute, we won't have to come back to you on each. And that's, um, you know, signage in the right of way. So um, if they were put signage to give their patrons um, some um, instructions that um, we think that could be of um, a size um, consistent with the political signage and consistent with that law. So most of the time it would probably be something like on a wire sign that they could move in the evening, put back during the day. Um, and we would help them, we could, we could certainly help them with that uh, language or whatever it needs to be. We would help them place them so that they don't interfere with um, traffic movement like at an intersection blocking sight distance or would affect um, ADA. Um, we would um, propose that if they were to mark the pavement with a white marker that doesn't interfere with water, sewer, electric, gas markings that would be clear. Um, and if they were to use um, the typical pavement paint that you'd get at most hardware stores, and we can certainly point them in the right direction there. You know, a line of um, two to three inches on the sidewalk width for the width of the sidewalk or a dot or some other generic footprints or something like that that was generic stenciled and, and neat really wouldn't interfere with anything. Um, 
we could certainly help them along those lines. Um, and then um, if they were to have to go into the shoulder or something, Public Works could assist them in doing that in a way that um, could keep traffic separated from their patrons. So we might assist them with some cones or something like that if the council desired. Um, if that's acceptable, I think we'd like to be able to move forward because we expect these to come fairly quickly after June 1st. Um, if they wanted something different, like they wanted to use their logo or they wanted to use a different color, I certainly could help them come in front of you and give you the pros and cons. Logos might interfere on federal aid highways with um, our billboard policy, uh, billboard state um, statutes and things like that. So we could certainly, those should probably be looked at individually. But if they're simply wanting to put lines and some instruction signage out there on how to how to separate, I, I think that we could do that and be with very low impact and be able to support them. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the council? Councilor Ray. I thought this was a great proposal to come forward. Um, I personally think, um, and folks might have a different opinion, I think we should just go ahead with the marking should be white and consist of lines, um, just standard. I think as soon as we get into um, having folks come before us, we are then getting into um, some uncomfortable territory with deciding on logos or things like that. Um, and I'm just thinking of um, a sign recently came up and I had to ask um, Dave Hedegar if it was appropriate based on free speech and things like that. So I, I would prefer that we not get in that business, especially when there are really more pressing matters to attend to. Thank you, Councilor Pettengill. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I have to ask, I wonder, especially after a presentation um, by the public art group, if this isn't a way to incorporate some more art into the city and make it a little fun for people that are out and about. Um, unfortunately, I, I wasn't quick enough to bring up my, my Facebook page, to maybe share it. Um, but at, at my business, we uh, spray painted colored leaves. Um, out for people to be able to stand on while they're waiting outside if they're not able to, to get inside the building. Um, you know, so I, I, I understand trying to make it similar to, to what the state does, um, but why not be unique? You know, I, I get, you know, nothing, nothing grandiose out there, but let's let people be art, artistic and, and give them an opportunity to, to shine and do their unique brilliance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes, go ahead. The one business that's come to us was originally thinking about logos to address both council's um, concerns. I told them that there were there might be a series of issues associated with that. They quickly moved to going to icons, and they were working with um, uh, one of the local art groups to try to figure out what those simple generic icons might be that would fit. So I think that's um, kind of, and they were thinking maybe footprints or something like that. So I, I I'm just trying to address both counselors thing. And I think that that business very quickly saw that that was the right path to go. So I, I think that'll work. Okay, thank you, Councilor Clement. I simpler is better in this case. I can go along with the, the lines. Footprints are a good idea. We start mixing colors. I think it's confusion. Uh, there are other pavement markings out there, as uh, Dale mentioned, the gas, electric, uh, dig safe, all the different colors they put down. I think keep it simple, keep it white, make it a straight line or perhaps a set of footprints. And then it's unique uh, to the city, I guess. And it's the same throughout the city. So you don't have to guess as to what you're looking at. Uh, keep, it, uh, keep it simple. Okay, thank you, Councilor Ray. Just to clarify, I, I respect what Councillor Pettengill is saying and think there's so much creativity in, in this community. Um, I um, can just imagine, though, you know, um, representing the area where I do, I've had some very particular complaints about very particular um, sorts of businesses. And so the second someone paints marijuana leaves on the sidewalk, I'm going to be getting calls. Um, and so that's what I'm thinking more than um, trying to stifle anyone's creativity. Thank you. All right, so uh, any chance we're gonna be a little proactive? There's a couple of uh, businesses that seem to have groups of people in it. And uh, you know, I wonder if we might be able to reach out to them and make suggestions. 
You absolutely can. Okay, good, thank you. All right, so I think the council overall is very supportive of this. Okay, okay agenda item number six, and Ed, you're up. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, you have a memo in your packet, basically uh, to summarize it, Brookfield White Pine Hydro is proposing an amendment to their uh, FERC license that would adjust the boundary for the Lewiston Falls Monty project. The Monty project is that building right behind Councillor Ray's left shoulder. Um, basically it's right here in, in downtown Lewiston and currently the project boundary uh, extends from uh, the dam downstream about five miles. They are proposing to shorten that up to just to an area just below uh, kind of where Festival Plaza and Longley uh, Bridge come across. So they're considerably shortening what they're uh, proposing to have in the project boundary. Part of their justification, of course, is that they no longer own the canal system. Uh, and the canal system has been removed from their project. But that canal system itself is uh, considerably less than, than that. I think it's more like it's less than a, a mile downstream where the, uh, maybe it's about a mile where the uh, lower canal finally uh, exits the canal system. We would like to, um, first off, there was a public comment period that everybody missed because it fell right in the middle of the initial COVID responses. So I know Auburn didn't pick it up. We didn't pick it up. Um, I think we finally heard about it from um, Peter Rubens, who's been very interested in the river, but he missed the initial period as well. But we would like to file a comment with, the, uh, with FERC in opposition to this change for a couple of reasons. One is that when they go through the relicensing process in a few years, one of the issues that will be discussed and aired is the contributions that the project will make to recreational amenities associated with the project. Uh, we would like to see areas along our waterfront, just particularly the downtown area, included as potential recreational amenities. Uh, we've obviously got Smart Pain Park. We have a plan to extend the uh, walk down the river, at least to Cedar Street and potentially beyond. Uh, there is a, a, has been discussion of a whitewater rafting possibility or whitewater um, kayaking possibility down at Dresser Rips, which is just this side of, uh, of the I-95 bridge. Um, so there are a number of possibilities that the city would have there. So we would not support them seeing the entire area taken out of the project. And I guess our other uh, position is that it really makes sense for this to be considered at the time the whole license is, being, is up for renewal. The suspicion is that this is being done now to just get that whole recreational discussion uh, off, the off the potential table. And we think it should at least stay on there. We understand there's probably some reason to, uh, that they can reasonably argue to shorten the, uh, the project boundaries, but five miles seems to be a bit ex excessive in this instance, particularly recognizing that uh, the original recreation plan that was, that was approved 20 some years ago included, we believe, the, uh, the boat launching ramp that the city has off River Road, just in town from the, wa from the wastewater treatment facility. So uh, Auburn, I know, has discussed this. Uh, they discussed it at their last workshop last Monday. We would like to uh, do the same. Their council seemed to be amenable to putting in a comment. We would like to coordinate our comments with them. Um, and Dave Hedegar would work with their planning people who are working on that. So all we're looking for at this point is you're uh, okay to go ahead and file comments opposing uh, what has been proposed. Okay, thank you, Ed. Questions or comments? By that, I'll take we're okay with a letter being drafted. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Jensen. Okay. Um, yes, Absolutely. I am. All right. Uh, Councilor uh, Joy? Yes, uh, I, I just want to agree with that. Uh, I read the document, uh, it's quite lengthy, uh, but I agree with them. Um, I, I think folding in uh, and allowing this to go through 
uh, will short change not only our city, but the city of Auburn across the river as well uh, in the long run. So I agree that uh, we should move forward and uh, contest it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Clement. Absolutely, go for it. Thank you. And Councilor Jensen, I didn't cut you off, did I? No, 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 not at all. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Councilor Gelinas, is that your hand? No. Yep, I just wanted to say that I am strongly in support of this boundary not being reduced, so absolutely in favor of us moving forward. Okay, thank you. Councilor Pattengill, anything? I'm in support of it. I just, I didn't know if you had seen Councillor Gelinas wanted to speak, so. Yeah, okay. Just make sure, let's just try to remember to raise our hands because that's what I'm looking at on the side of the screen. So that just helps me, not physically, but hit that little button. Are you messing with me, Councillor Pettengill? <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ed. Uh, so I'll entertain a uh, motion to enter into an executive session to discuss labor negotiations regarding the Lewiston Police Supervisor Command Unit. So moved. So moved. Moved by Councillor Clement, seconded by Councillor Khalid. Uh, call the roll. Off mute. All right, thank you. Council from Ward 1? Yes. Ward 2? Yes. Ward 3? Yes. Ward 4? Yes. Ward 5? Yes. Ward 6? Yes. And Ward 7? Yes. Motion passed by vote of 7 to 0. Okay, thank you, and we'll see you at the executive session meeting.